The Big Footy Port LA podcast is proudly sponsored by New Vision. My team, Kanda, power. I love the power. power, power. I love the power. power, power. All right, we ready? Yeah. Let's do this. G'day everyone, I'm Macca19 and you are listening to the Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast live for the very first time on Port Fan Radio, a new dedicated online fan-driven radio station dedicated to the Port Adelaide Footy Club. Uh, we are joined by co-hosts and the brains behind the Venture Fishing, Rick. How are you, mate? Mate, I'm very excited and I love it. Dedicated was used about five times there, Macca. We are dedicated and it's an exciting night tonight. Fantastic. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. This is exciting. Oh, there's no no edits here, so there's no going back. Nowhere to hide, mate. This is scary. <laughs> no, it's good. I'm looking forward to it too. Look, we've got uh, some Port Adelaide Footy Club royalty with us here tonight. Uh, one of them's late, so he's not here at the moment. He'll be uh, joining us a little bit later. Uh, but between them, they've got um, nearly 550 games, 14 premierships, a couple of best and fairest, and a Jack Odie medal. Um, the one that we are speaking with at the moment... Um, the great George Fiacci. How are you, buddy? Oh, very good. How are you guys? Fantastic. Oh, and, and congratulations, by the way. It's fantastic that you've been able to put this initiative together, and uh, uh, and I'm looking forward to being part of your inaugural um, broadcast tonight. So it should be fun. But apologies, Timmy Jennifer's running late. He's just putting some makeup on, and uh, probably <laughs> some of his shocking jokes. That's it. <laughs> What's going on with oh, Timmy's yeah. jokes? Uh, they're not very good, are they? No, nah, they're terrible. Yeah, but you know what? He'll still laugh, and everyone laughs at his laugh, so everyone thinks he's funny, but uh, <laughs> they are terrible. Uh, good boy. That's exactly right. Well, look, as we do with all the guests on the podcast, um, George, can you give us a bit of a rundown with your history with Port Adelaide? My history with Port Adelaide? Um, well, I grew up as a Port Adelaide supporter. I grew up in the Rosewater area, so I've been black and white through and through. I played... Uh, for the under 15s was the first uh, time I got a chance to put on the Port Adelaide Guernsey and came through the grades. I made my debut in 1985 um, and uh, I finished in 97 having played in 236 games and one of those fortunate players to play in seven premierships, which uh, which is something that uh, I look back now and go, wow, that was amazing. So I pinched myself, I must admit, a few times to think, Geez, how lucky were you to uh, play in that many premierships? But uh, they're all very special, and uh, and it was fantastic to be part of. And you know, the most important part is is the supporters. You know, that, that's the part I really miss about footy, not being involved as a player. Now you do miss the supporters because they were very passionate. They were always one hundred and ten percent behind you, especially when you won. And when you didn't win, they let you know when you weren't playing too well. That's for sure. George obviously had a lot of highlights, but starting in uh, nineteen eighty five was a. Uh... There was a few tough years for the footy club back then. Yeah, it was tough. Yeah, okay, that was. Um, I, I trained. Um, I was playing under seventeens, and uh, Russell Ebert took over coaching. And uh, so my first training session was under uh, Russell Ebert. And uh, look, as growing up as a kid, Russell Ebert was my idol, having won four McGarry medals. And uh, he was talking to us, and I was just I had stars in my eyes. And anyway, he's gone down one, and I've gone down the other end. We're, we're having kick to kick, and. Uh, he was kicking to me and I just said, oh, my God, Russell Lee was about to kick to me. So, anyway, he's kicked the ball. I've jumped over the moon, gone to grab the ball. The ball had gone straight through my hands, smashed me in the nose and Russell runs past and the first words he said to me, keep your eyes on the bleeping ball. So, uh, so Russell Lee's first words, to me. very encouraging. But it was 1985 and 84, uh, you know, we made the grand final. I hadn't made my debut then. I was playing Bs. Um, but, yeah, 85 was tough. Yeah, we had a good side, 85 and 86. Uh, but we just weren't cracking it. And in 87, um, when we uh, hit the post, I think Abba hit the post there in the prelim final, so we missed out on... Uh, no, it wasn't prelim, actually. It was, um, I think we got knocked down in straight sets again. So the first four finals I played in finals game, uh, we actually lost. So then Jack Cowell came along, and he was a different style of coach, very uh, you know, confident, uh, making sure that you were confident and, and, and let you off the lease and let you run around and do what you thought you had to do. And... History will say that he was very successful, having won the you know, seven premierships out of the, the next 10 years or whatever it was. It's a fantastic era to be a Port Adelaide supporter, that's for sure. Um, now, you started as a midfielder, but ended up um, as that fantastic attacking back pocket that we all loved and that uh, opposition fans love to hate as well. Um, what was the turning point in your career? Well, look, I, I, I keep telling him I was the greatest rover ever to play back pocket for football club. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, look, I've, all my all my football career as a junior was on the ball, playing as a rover. Obviously, I wasn't that that tall, and and uh, as it made my league debut as a as a rover, so I played the first few years, and then Stephen Curtis, who was the back pocket back then, the old uh, old Curtis used to wear the the helmet. When he was playing, he got injured one game, and they threw me back there just to, to cover one of the Rovers. And Russell Ebert in the bath on Thursday night said, uh, you did a pretty good job last week. I'm going to play again there in the back pocket. I said, no way. I said, you're not serious. I was I was so disappointed. I said, no way. Anyway, so um, he played me there, uh, and I thought, well, I don't care. You can play me there. I'm just going to play like a Rover anyway. So and that's where I just started running down like a lunatic and uh, just trying to get as many – touches as I possibly could and it became a part of the uh, the back lines uh, or defence tradition there where we are all trying to outdo each other, trying to see who could kick a goal and who could get the most kicks. So uh, it, was, it was quite good. But that was the, that's what really happened. That was the truth. He, uh, I filled in for Steve Curtis and then Russell Lieber kept me there and then John Carroll came along and said, yep, you're playing in the back pocket uh, and you're not moving from there. I played the occasional game on the ball, but it didn't matter. And they let me do what I wanted to do, which was run down and and be creative. Which you, know, you made the position your own or my own. Well, when I when I think of George Fiacci, I think of one of the uh, the best um, partnerships in defence with your partner in crime, uh, Roger Delaney. Yeah, we had, look. We Roger and I are good mates, and we were good mates back then. And you, you know, we, we just just click. It's just a. It, Back then, it was all natural to us. We didn't think it was anything special, but everyone saw this special bond, and you know, we used to kick to each other. And but you know, because he was the full back, I was and I was the back pocket. I just had to read off him all the time and making sure that when he spoiled the ball, he knew where I was, and when I had the ball, I knew where he was because it was a fantastic kick. So all you had to do with Rogers' lead, and he'd hit you on the chest. But yeah, we became very close, and uh, we still are today. But uh, it was unique, and people look back and go, "Wow, the way you guys used to read off each other and play off each other is it was uh, it was a bit different." But I must admit, it didn't always work. There was a few times Rog would, uh, everyone would start to get wise that Roger was going to kick to me every time he got the ball. So as soon as he had it, they'd man up on me and, and Roger would use me as a dummy and, and just go past me and ignore me. And, and I used to start getting shitty at him saying, Rog, stop doing that. I said, I'm doing all this running. You better start kicking to me. So anyway, one day he decides at Albert and Oval, I'll just do it again. So he went to dodge past me. So I just stopped and I spot, he kicked the ball and kicked it straight into me. So that was uh, wasn't probably the the best uh, play we've ever uh, done together. But, um, no, we did uh, have some great times. And, uh, yeah, look, looking back, it did work quite well. The um, But, uh, you know, it was just the relationship we had was close and I think we just knew what each other was going to do next and that's why we played. Well, Bevan just tweeted in wanting to know if Roger made you look good or if you made Roger look good. Well, you know, what can you say about Roger? Like, you know, he... I remember in 95, I think it was, when he wore that helmet after he got his uh, head reconstructed. He, he tried to look like <laughs> Batman. He thought he was Batman. But, uh, yeah, of course I carried him. I, I say that all, all the time. And I can keep reminding him that in 1990, when he went to Fitzroy, I ended up winning the Jack Odie medal, so I didn't need him anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm, that, that's my answer. I carried him. Good work. That's it. Yeah. What's your favourite memory of, uh, of your on-field career? Oh... There were so many of them. Look, there was uh, the, the thing about uh, us as a team, we, we were very close. We were really good mates and uh, a lot of that was built up over a number of years with Greg Phillips who, when he came back from Collingwood, really taught us how to how to relax with our football, have fun um, and, and don't be so serious, don't take it so serious, which is what we did. Um, you know, we knew when we had to go hard, we went hard, but we also enjoyed ourselves and, and really enjoyed being out there with each other and I think... The thing I really got out of football was the defence. It was such a close unit. And, you know, look, I walked into a team where there was a, you know, uh, Martin Leslie on a half-back flank, Greg Phillips at centre-half forward, and Bruce Abernethy in the other one. And I'm sitting in the back pocket going, well, the ball's not coming past those three, so I'm just going to take off and run down the ground. And I don't know how many times Greg Phillips would look up and kick the ball and kick it to me and go, what the hell are you doing down there? You're the back pocket. Get back here. So uh, we used to have a bit of fun, but... Asking me about my favourite moments, almost like asking me, you know, favourite premierships. You know, obviously premierships are the highlight, and you can't pick one. You know, it's almost like saying who's your favourite kid. Um, yeah. But '94 stands out. You know, '94 because that big comeback. I think uh, 1990, where all the pressure when uh, uh, Port Adelaide uh, made its bid to join the AFL or VFL back then. Uh, it was uh, you know us against the world, and everyone hated our guts, and everyone wanted to see us fail. So going to that game, there was so much pressure. Um, that uh, you just couldn't help but uh, think, geez, if we don't win this, we're going to be the laughing stock of Australia. 
Um, but we ended up getting through it, winning it, and winning quite well. Um, so 1990. Look, 89 was also a big one where we kept uh, North LA down to one goal late. And if you look back through their side, they had a fantastic team. You know, they had the Jarman boys and Michael mm. Redden. They had Daryl Hart, so they had this fantastic team. But, you know, on that day, we just clicked and uh, we just shut them down. They couldn't get anywhere near it. Uh, and, and to kick one goal eight, uh, which is a record, is, is something that's memorable. Mm. So, look, I could keep talking about all the premierships, but how long we got? <laughs> as long as you want, mate. As long as you want. I'm sure the, uh, the listeners would be glad to, uh, to hear it. Daniel Willoughby wanted to know, um, do you have a team which you played in which was the most memorable and why? A team that I played in the most memorable? Um, I guess maybe out of the premiership sides, did one, one side stick out more than another? Oh, look, I think the 88 side was really, really strong. Um, and, but uh, then you look in, you know, when we had Martin Leslie, then he left that year, uh, went away. But the 1990 side was super strong. You know, we had Wanganin in, um, and and there was just stars right across the right across the ground from both sides. You know, the Glenelg in 1990 had uh, McDermott and had uh, David Marshall, and mind you, 11 of their players ended up playing for the Crows the following year. So so it was a really strong competition back there. Uh, but I, I think those those first few years there were some fantastic teams. But we were just a fantastic unit. That that's what I really what I remember the most. We had uh, Nathan Buckley come in in '92. Like you know, uh, we had uh, Wanganeen Buckley. We had all these superstars. But still, we just kept this basics of there was you know there's probably you know ten of us that went through the whole era, and we'd bring players in, and some would come in, and some would go out. But we had kept this uh, unique culture running through and uh, every player that came in they had to play the Port Adelaide way which is the way we were playing and, and making sure that when they left the footy club they were better players and you know, a lot of them went on to bigger and better things like Wanganeen and, and Buckley um, and, and there's a host of other players went off and played AFL but, but for me it was probably you know, just the core players that we had there you know, you're talking the Ginevers, the Delaney's, the Rowan Smith, the Darren Smith, the Scotty Hodges um, uh, oh, look, Greg Phillips's, uh, the Abernethy's. Craig was, Bradley. Craig, you know, well, yeah, he was there early in the career, but he didn't play in any, any of our premierships. Uh, we said he's not good enough to play in our premiership, so he went off to Carlton and played in a couple of theirs. Um, David Hutton. So there was a lot of, you know, Steve Williams, you forget Steve Williams. There were so many good players that were the core essence of our team. So we could bring, you know, two, three brand new players in each year and just keep growing, keep developing and, and uh, yeah, I suppose if you look back now, you go seven premierships in whatever it was, 10 years. Um, mm. You know, just paid that uh, John Carroll really set up a found, fantastic foundation. I should say Russell Ebert probably set it up. John Carroll come along and mm. uh, and made it super special, you know, by instilling that confidence in us and just allowing us to play our own game. And then in the end, we didn't need a coach. And that's without being, you know, uh, blindly rude. We just we used to coach ourselves. You know, if things went wrong, we used to take it upon ourselves to say, "Come on, guys, we need to switch on. What are we doing wrong? What's the team? You know, rules and and he'd get together." But I see uh, our mate Timmy Jennifer's finally put his makeup on. I think he's joined us, has he? Yeah. Have you stopped telling lies? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh he's, he told us it's all true, Tim. <laughs> oh, 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 I'm glad I've got on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> They just asked me how good I was. I've been gone for the last half hour. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll check back in in an hour. <laughs> hey, I, I just had Al tweet in wanting to know, do you guys remember who was the player that um, let that goal go through in the 89 grand final? Oh, yeah. We all know that. Yeah, yeah. Between, between us, we know, don't we, Georgie boy? Yeah, we're not going to give it away, but it was Trigger. Yeah. <laughs> His initials are Simon Tregenza. Yeah. <laughs> he used to wear number 12. <laughs> I know where he lives. <laughs> oh, dear. We did, do some, uh, we did some, do some digging, actually, when we had George and Roger Delaney's roast um, last, season, last year, and we actually did find that George ignores a Roger lead when, to switch play and goes down the line and that's when the ball turns over and Trigger's man does kick the goal. But we did blame George. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Had to fall back to me. Yes, a fancy defender going down the line. What's going on? What was I thinking? Ah, <laughs> you idiot. Take yeah. the game sure. on. Surely the uh, the person who allowed that goal to happen would have had to buy the beers. 
Uh, it took us a while to find out, to tell you the truth. Yeah. yeah. A lot of been, you know, obviously euphoria afterwards, but a couple of days later when you start to have some quiet ones, uh, you start talking about it. How did that happen? And then, yeah, slowly but surely the truth made its way yeah. to the front. <laughs> yeah, tr- Trigger wasn't wasn't taking responsibility, was he? <laughs> it was it was he blame. He was blaming someone else. But uh, who was the player, Tim? You'd remember? Uh, was it um, Craig Burton? What, the, it was Craig Burton who kicked it. Yeah, yeah, yeah on his yeah. left. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, poor old but, Trigger. Yeah. He was standing at the time and and didn't take ownership of it, did he? He said, "No, that's not him." And we we all sat there watching the replay, and there it came. There he was chasing him. Well, his punishment <laughs> his punishment was he had to end up at the Crows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Greg Boyd, I reckon, was getting blamed on the on the Saturday night, which was very unfair. Yeah, well, I would blame Greg Boyd for everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So now that they're both on, Craig, is it a, a good time to maybe um, ask George about the uh, the one club uh, and how how that all started? Uh, I know. Yeah. I know Tim said it was was all him, and and George just tagged along. So we better we better get George's side of the events for this one. <laughs> yes, no. I look, I'd love to take credit for it, but uh, no, it's a, it was very much a team team uh, initiative. We uh, and it took a long time to to get up. Uh, and I sp- the way it started, I suppose, I'll give you a quick overview. Was uh, Brian Cunningham rang me out of the blue one day? Said, "Look, George, we want to get the two teams together. We want to we want to make sure the power and the Magpies are together, all as one club." and they're going to put a proposal to the SANFL because you know, both teams were struggling at that time. He said, I want you to talk to some of the guys at um, you know, of your area and see if they can back the proposal. So, yeah, yeah, no worries. So we did that and, uh, of course, I went through uh, went through the SANFL and they knocked it back. And the next day I rang Brian Cunningham and said, right, what are we doing, mate? What's going on? He goes, well, we can't do anything. And Brian was on the commission at that time. He actually uh, resigned because of it. Uh, so, well, there's nothing we can do. We go, no, nah, come on, we've got to fight. Keep fighting this. Don't just give up. So so Tim and I got together. We had a bit of a chat and we spoke to a, one of our uh, mentors, is Jimmy Nitsky and Jeff Monteleone, and we'd get together and David Keyes and we had, had a few coffees over about a six-month period planning what our next tactic would be. So, Tim, do you want to jump in and tell us what happened after that? Sorry, mate, I just nodded off. Were you talking? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, I actually, I actually did uh, forget about that little uh, uh, meeting at your house, wasn't it, with uh, Bucky, going through that? I forgot about that one. But, um, yeah, look, pretty much. I, I can tell you now, honestly, that George definitely drove it. He, he said, "Come on, let's meet." So we went and met, and he just said, "Listen, we can't stop this. We gotta, gotta have a go." Because he said, "Now, uh, Port Adelaide are in a position." Of compromise, he said. The SNFL certainly don't want to stop the Magpies falling away, so he was going to pick it up. And he was right in saying, he said, "Listen, we're going to we're going to drive a campaign." He said, "But you're going to front it." He said, "Because everybody likes you and everybody hates me." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's when he's right. We went and got those other guys involved, and, and they were just great, wise old heads that had been around for a long time, and especially in the transition from, from our SNFL days into that first um, AFL licence. And, yeah, they were really, really helpful. And we sort of – we basically ran the ran the uh, campaign parallel um, to what was happening at the SNFL and, and the uh, and the power. So, yeah, it was a really interesting time and, and, and one that uh, I, th- I think has uh, eventually, you know, drawn about some positives – um, I, I must say, my model in my mind uh, always had a junior structure to it, which is uh, probably the one thing that's been very shattering on, on our part, anyway. So, but yeah, that's that's the next challenge, isn't it, George? Oh, look, yeah, and we had to compromise so much to get the two teams together, which is ridiculous. You know, the SANFL, who were the owners of the Port Adelaide Football Club license. Um, so they controlled everything, and I'm not anti SNFL by the way, because I think it's a fantastic competition. But you know what they did to Port Adelaide—they were hoping the Magpies were going to die, basically. But if the Ma- what Tim and I knew that if the Magpies died, the Port Adelaide Football Club would die because you yeah. know, the Magpie supporters weren't going to go just follow the power because they a lot of them were blaming the power for the um, from where the Magpies because of the Magpies die situation because they were they were broke, they had no home, um, and and their success was dwindling. 
So it became almost the two Port Adelaide football clubs fighting against each other. So we had to change that. And I think you look back now, you'll go, well, with this certainly one club, the two teams are working together. Um, the model was probably not what we thought it would be, but we had to compromise because of the SANFL. But look, I think uh, we're not going to give up fighting. We're still going to you know, fight for to get a zone back one day, potentially have some more juniors because I think the junior structure is important for Port Adelaide, especially the Magpies. Uh, but we're working through that at the moment. So, but in hindsight, I think uh, yeah, I think it all worked out reasonably well. Timmy, what do you think, mate? Yeah, look, I, I remember having our first meeting with Keith Thomas and. We'd been sort of a little bit frustrated previously and then you know, sort of said, listen, mate, I, I gave it to him, what I thought I was giving it to him straight up, and I said, you got 29,000 members now. I said, if you allow the magpies to disappear, I said, you'll have uh, you'll lose 10 overnight. And I said, we can't afford mm. that. And I, I didn't want us to be uh, weak at any level. And unfortunately, we were being... Uh, as George said, compromised on both levels and it was the old divide and conquer so that the two weren't being successful and that was just not that's just not great for for our, our footy club. So, you know, by well, getting it a lot South Australian football in general, really. You want two yeah, healthy clubs, it. surely. Yeah. Correct. And so we needed to, you know, get Port Adelaide back to together as you know, there is only one Port Adelaide and that was always in our brain. How can you possibly get two? And the great thing about I suppose that meaning was I didn't even have to finish my sentence. And Keith said, oh, no, nah, I get it. He said, I just don't understand how we got to this point. I said, oh, mm. thank the Lord for that, I said. <laughs> yeah, it, made yeah. us, it made us feel a lot better. But, but you know, also, to Keith's credit, they've jumped all over. They, they push the one club all the time. And, uh, you know, it's fantastic to hear them the way they talk. And you can see you know, the success of the club has been because these guys have grabbed it and they just run with it. They're really driving that Port Adelaide way, the Port Adelaide tradition, and, and they're very serious about it. They don't. It's not just fake talk. They're actually really passionate about the history of the football club and, uh, and being proud of it and making sure that the current players understand the, the actual traditions of the club, which you know, I think Timmy used, they used Timmy quite a bit to, to tell him how good uh, he used to be and back in how he won all those premierships. But... But again, it's uh, it's just the whole club is back together again. We're all talking the same language. We're all following mm. the same team, and and you know, it's you can see where there's a lot of momentum going forward. Now we just got to win a couple of more games, and we'll be right. Well, that's a that's quick a, a quick Turn detour. Sleep, off the, no, no, it's good. Um, Port Adelaide 1870 asked uh, or tweeted in asking, um, can the, can you old boys see a similarity between the '95 side and the 2015 teams? Oh. Similarity, gee, that's twenty years ago. Um, uh, yeah, I'm anybody, struggling to remember. Has anybody got a mullet like uh, Clive Waterhouse? <laughs> <laughs> Plenty in the crowd, I think, man. Yeah, you know, the, the 2000 uh, mullet is now a beard, isn't it? Is that what everyone uh, thinks? It looks trendy. We thought the mullet was trendy back then. Mind you, having said that, I wish I had one now. Be the fantastic comb over I'd have. Yeah, I, I think you're right. But oh, look, if you want to put any sim- similarities into it. Good teams have, uh, you know, uh, good key position players. They have good midfields, and they've got depth. So, I- any successful team's got to have those combinations. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of, you can't. It's two different games, two different teams, two different eras. Like you can't really compare. What I will say though is, is the team certainly plays the Port Adelaide way. They defend first, they tackle hard, they put the opposition under pressure, and when they get the opportunity, they just run. And, you know, that was always a philosophy we had when we were playing. Uh, you, know, you, you defend first, you play hard, uh, put them under pressure, and when you get the ball, you just take off and you run. And that's exactly the way we used to play. It wasn't uh, brain surgery, but, yeah, certainly the game's changed a bit in 20 years, though, that's for sure. Mm, that's it. Well, George, yeah. you're a board member. Um, what's the biggest challenge facing the current Port Adelaide Footy Club board? Oh, look, the biggest challenge is... Uh, one- yeah, one one is that Timmy Jenner never works for the club, so how we keep him in line? That, that's uh, one of our major challenges. The other one is, uh, you know, we've got to make profit, we've got to make some money. Um, you know, we've had uh, a couple of lean years, but um, we've been invested investing very heavily in football in the football department, um, and we can see the um, what's coming out of that. You know, we've got a fantastic go- coach, got some fantastic players, great assistants, fitness coaches. Uh, so the guys are, are not wanting for anything. Um, so now we've just got to get the sponsorship to, to, to flow on in the corporate world. Uh, memberships going great guns and already re- achieved their targets and we'll be close to, we'll get 60,000 very shortly. So 
So from where we're sitting at the moment, things are tracking quite well, and I think we'll reach our our budgeted figure for sponsorship, which will mean for the first time in in a long time we'll we'll make a profit, and that's been the, the goal. I think Koshy's been out there publicly stating uh, we're going to make a profit this year, so things are looking good so far. So. The board role, is that a three-year term? You, and you started in 2012, is that right? Correct, correct. And, um, so, yes, I'm, I'm up at the end of this year, I reckon. So I'm, I'm one of the member votes. Yep. So um, member elects, I should say. Um, uh, so, yeah, I come up at the end of this year. Yep. So we'll have a look and see how we're going. But you know, when I came on, it wasn't as uh, rosy as what it was now, was it, Timmy? It was, um, there was a no. – we were – we were still banging our heads against a brick wall going, what is going on here? You keep saying you're doing this stuff, but you're actually not doing any of it. So mm. I thought, you know, enough whinging. I need to jump on the board and see if I can have some sort of influence. But, you know, I jumped on the board and with David Kosh and the, and the, the other board members, you know, they're all on board. They all exactly knew exactly what we needed to do and they've, they've worked tremendously well. And, you know, I've just been sitting on the board having a cup of coffee and a cream <laughs> bun whenever I need to and let them do all the hard work. So you you enjoying the role? You you reckon you'll you'll keep going or put yourself oh, up again? Yes, yeah, so I look at yeah. The, the role can be full time if you let it be full time. So we meet once a month, but you know, I'm on the mm. footy strategic committee. I do some work with the Magpies as well. So um, there's a lot of uh, committees etc. You, you work on. But look, I, I love the place. It's a fantastic uh, football club. It's a, it's something that I've been a fan of since I was you know, five years old. So you know, the more I get involved, the yeah, the better I feel about it all, and so the club's in a, in a fantastic position at the moment. I'll, I'd love to stay there for the ride if I can. Great. You go, Rick. No, you're right. I was just about to say, are we up to the next section, Craig, or you got another question for him, mate? I was just going to say, um, how was the feedback for the first home game this year? Oh, yeah, okay. What part of the foot are you talking about or the... Um... Yeah, there's two parts. <laughs> yeah. I think you can go, More of the off-field you can go, stuff. Yeah, you can go pre-game and, and what the club did and the uh, and then we can talk about the uh, the on-field, I guess. All right, well, let me ask, what, were you, what did you guys think of the pre-game? Yeah. What was that, Tim? No, no, I just laughed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually like the village. Um, some of the, some of the feedback I've read online is people liked more would like more choice with the the food stalls in the village. But I, I thought for the limited space and uh, and what you've done, I, I really enjoyed it. I didn't I didn't get to see the the kids section. Unfortunately, my all my kids are nearly in their twenties now, so I don't have to worry about that. But I, again, I heard positive feedback uh, from the the parents that actually used it. So. I think they're quite innovative ideas, and uh, I like the fact that the Ferris brothers um, came out, uh, but didn't have a microphone uh, to sing the song. I really, I thought it was great to recognise uh, their work with uh, the NTUA. Um, I don't know if Koshi needed to come out as well as the host, but I mean he's done such a great job. You can't begrudge him of that. So look, I, I really, I enjoyed the spectacle, and I thought it was fantastic, and the crowd was really. Um, into the atmosphere when the game started. Oh, look, I think that village was fantastic. I, that was, you know, I'd heard about it, and they were, they were trying to create the um, croquet club feel. And when I yep. walked in, I go, "Wow, this is amazing!" And I, I went there after the game. I must admit, so I didn't see it pre-game, but it was, it was outstanding. The atmosphere was really good, and considering it was a loss as well, um, but it was. I thought that was great. I think the kids zone. The more kids stuff we can do, the better. I think and. Um, you know, we need to attract as many young supporters as we possibly can to Adelaide Oval. So I think that's positive. Look, the never tear us apart. I was, I was getting goosebumps watching the whole crowd. I wasn't watching the Ferris Brothers as much. I was watching the crowd. They're all standing in their seats and the scarves are waving right across the ground. It's just amazing to watch. And that was spectacular. But, you know, the Koshi at the front with the microphone walking the stage, I must uh, on the Oval, I had a bit of a chuckle because... The guy blowing the siren waited to Koshi start talking before he blew the siren, I reckon, because every time he tried to say something, the siren would go. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that didn't quite go to plan. But, look, I think it was good. I just hope, um, I think Timmy will agree with this, that they allow things just to be natural now and just evolve because, we, you know, what we don't want to have is um, too much, cram too much into 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 a let it evolve, let the fans take over and let the fans, you know, really make the pre-game their own, which they have. And I think it'll, if they can do that every game, stand up and, and wave their scarves to never tear us apart, it's just fantastic. Just absolutely and bef- fantastic. 
and before Maka gives his opinion on it, just quickly, the, the two the other two things I didn't make reference to was I love the introduction of Russell Ebert to kick the first goal. I, I thought that was great respect for the legend of the club that he is. And I heard this rumour about there was this Tim, uh, dancing Timmy G on the screen. I, I don't know about that. Yeah, we'd like to maybe just let that go through to the keeper and <laughs> hopefully nobody saw it. <laughs> oh, plenty of people I think that's when everyone it. started walking out. Yeah, yeah. It was half time. <laughs> well, I, I missed it, mate. What do you think some of the uh, Power Boys must have seen that because they fell in a hole after that? Oh, but, hey, I was trying to get them out. <laughs> and I, looked, I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the the pre-game stuff as well. The game day village is a revelation. I'm going to be there every home game, I think. I, I thought it was fantastic. I uh, really love the setup. Uh, I've heard a few people complain that the music was maybe a bit too loud, but that's neither here nor there for me. I thought it was fantastic. Um, the pre-game stuff, I, I agree with George. So long as the uh, the fans keep it natural, um, so long as the club keeps it um, you know organic and just so it naturally evolves, I think it's going to be a fantastic thing. Yeah, I, I, I went down to uh, Rundle Mall as well, guys. I did a bit of a had a bit of a chat over there and. Jesus, some passionate people around. The crowd were fantastic over there as well. There was lots of people. They're all listening to every word that uh, the guys are all talking. So it was, and, and we had the uh, release of the hit there by uh, at sunset, uh, the new song, sorry, the new Port Adelaide song. So, you know, there's, there's plenty to be d- to do uh, on game day. So it becomes a real great afternoon, you know, not just the footy but uh, of entertainment and then the footy comes alongside of that. So as long as we keep winning, they'll be, um, it'll be a very good day. I think that's what hit me as a reality and some of the feedback when I was obviously calling the game on 5AA afterwards was a lot of our people just said, uh, let's get back to just winning footy games. That's the best entertainment you can get. And that is just, you know, that's the reality of it. As hard as the club works as it does for um, setting up a great game day experience, the best experience is when we win. And all that yeah. stuff then becomes... Uh, the, the, the cream on top because winning footy is what we're about and what they loved and you know the entertaining footy that we got last year was just outstanding so yeah you know, we started incredibly well last year 10 and 1 I think am I still on? Yep. Yeah you're still on oh, yeah. I've, Unfortunately I've you're still there mate <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I think that uh, you know 10 and 1 starts not going to happen this year obviously but we could quite you know, quite possibly have a, an incredible, you know, back half of the year rather than the front half and uh, really storm in. So I think there's plenty of good times ahead. There's no need to hit a panic button, but I, I'm with everybody else. Let's just let uh, that, those pre-game things happen naturally and we don't uh, we don't have to force anything along and it, it'll go really well. But I, I, I still want to sort of take my hat off to the club for everything it did do in the in the build up it made it pretty special as so, you know i think if we had a one by 10 everybody would be absolutely over the moon about what happened and and uh, and probably uh, give it even more plaudits yeah uh, timmy's hit on the head i think uh, irrespective of what happens if you don't win you know it's 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 irrelevant <laughs> so all the, all the, you can have all the entertainment you like but you've got to win and that's what uh, port Adelaide's about is about winning so Having spoken about that, the footy side of things, well, we do need to turn around quite quickly because uh, yeah, zero through for round one. As they get a few more games on their belt, they'll get better and better, and you'll see us playing that attacking style of football and taking the game on. And and yeah, there'll probably be a few changes this week, you'd think, but um, you know, we really do need to have a win and have a good win uh, this week against North Melbourne. So, so what with what you can ask uh, with your capacities in the club, I guess, but. I guess from I'd like to hear your opinion if you can. Um, uh, what do you What did you think about the especially the Sydney game? Because I really thought maybe our coaching panel got a little bit out coached um, by the Sydney coaching panel on on Saturday night, and they really locked down our our transition play and and really put high pressure on our on our sweeper, and and so they were able to set up a very effective zone. So even though we got a lot of inside fifty ball, it was just really inefficient and. Uh, we just didn't seem to have a plan B to, to counter Sydney. Yeah, I'll let Timmy get in trouble first. Off you go, Timmy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, look, 
having having um, and I don't like to bring this up too often. Having been a coach, um, all your best laid plans. <laughs> You're not going to say that on on air, eh? I'm not. Um, but all your best laid plans don't necessarily come to fruition. It's about execution, and I think as much uh, as Sydney now and and all clubs uh, are looking at us at a, as a very dangerous opponent, they will be planning to their heart's content to make sure that we can't do what we like to do. So that's uh, an area that we're going to have to now uh, get ourselves out of. But when you have a, a, f- a phenomenally different hit-out count, which there has been for two weeks, a, uh, and, a, and a really big difference in clearances uh, and, and the tax of uh, Sydney, was a, another one that was a big glaring um, difference, then those things are going to really hurt you regardless of what you're trying to achieve. And then when we did get it, I thought our foot skills execution, we've lost confidence there and we missed targets and missed goals that we wouldn't normally. So we couldn't get any momentum because of them and the way they strangled us. So, look, I, I would say that uh, anything we tried to put on paper and plan during the week as a uh, coaching staff uh You'd almost say null and void because of the way that the Sydney players executed their plan. Yeah, look, I reckon that's probably one of the best games I've seen Sydney play for a long, long time. But they weren't uh, dynamic in their movement forward. They they strangled us. They suffocated us. Didn't allow us uh, the opportunity to to get our run going at all. And then when we did get get the run going and go to kick up forward in our inside fifty, we were outnumbered each time. So. So we just, it looked like we weren't working hard enough and we're one of the hardest working teams going around, which makes me think that you know, some of the players are underdone. They're not uh, running on top of the ground. They're struggling a little bit. Um, but, you know, the disappointment was Saturday night was we were totally outplayed. You know, they were a quality side and they proved how good they were because they shut us down totally. We had no answer for it. Um, and, and, you know, it was really hard trying to pick a best player, especially in the midfield because we got smashed in the midfield. Um, but, again, we'll learn from that. Um, you know, I thought Freo game was we we're actually quite good and probably unlucky to lose that. But uh, I think uh, what I'm seeing is that when we've got control of the game, which we do, ha- we did have at Sydney in the start of it. We've actually got to capitalise. We got to score and score goals uh, uh, quickly. But we're not doing that at the moment, which is costing us later on in the game when when they they take control of the game and they're able to score. So, so yeah, we. We do need to do some work up forward. I'm not sure that it's quite, quite working at the moment with uh, Schultze, Westy, and um, and big uh, Paddy Ryder. Um, but I'm sure when they start to work out the strengths and weaknesses of each other, that they'll be a formidable you know, trio up forward and kick plenty of goals. Look, is it cause for panic, or have we just come up against two excellent sides? Because Frio and Sydney would be two of the maybe top three teams in the in the league currently. No, no panic. Don't, and that's, you know, what do you achieve by panic? Absolutely nothing. So uh, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big one for saying, look, you know, say we played, say our draw was different and we played uh, Melbourne and GWS and won those two games and it was a bit sloppy and all the rest of it. Uh, we could be hiding a few things. Um, so I actually think that we're playing the top four teams from last year. We're, we're going to learn very quickly about where we're at and then how much better we need to get. I think, for me, we now will have to scratch, bite and fight for, for uh, any win from here in the next couple of weeks. And I think that's a good thing, and, that, and that's going to be great. But, you know, come out of the, the other side, I, I think if we can be 3-3 three and three after six, I reckon we've got a really exciting season ahead. Yeah, I, look, I, and I, I have to back that up. I think if you know, at the start of the year, you looked at the draw and you go, you know, if we're actually three and two or two and three, we've actually done quite well because we've got a very tough draw. And if you look at the sides now, Frio, what they did to Geelong on the weekend shows you they are a quality side and they're going to be right up there. And Sydney, you know, they beat Essendon or, or, in, and in that last quarter and smashed Essendon in that last quarter. And Essendon, you know, beat the uh, reigning premiers the week after. So, you know, Sydney's going to be a quality side as well. So... I think we've probably played the two best teams going around, apart from Hawthorne, which, of course, we're going to play in next week. Um, so we'll certainly know uh, how good we're going to be and what we need to do to improve for us to compete against the better clubs this year. I think the boys are also suffering a bit of a, you know, victims of their own success because I guess as a supporter, I've been caught up in the emotion of what they did last year and 
and just thinking they're going to have this natural progression this year and become an all-conquering force because they're going to be that little bit more mature on on the back of their previous um, uh, feet. So I, I was looking at the draw thing and, oh, geez, I reckon we might be able to get away with this 4-1. and one. We might drop Frio at home, but we should be able to win at, win at our home. And, uh, yeah, so the boys are now dealing with expectation in the media, also supporters. Uh, it's probably something different that they're account- uh, encountering for the first time in a while. Yeah, well, you know, that's that's footy. Have a look at the uh, other side of the coin. The Crows were copying all the negative media. And, of course, they've had two good wins. And, of course, they're, they're now premiership favourites. And uh, and, yeah, and we're the ones who are struggling along. But things will change. Things will turn. Port Adelaide's a very good uh, team. It's got a great squad. You know, you look at if you look at the players, you go, there is some real quality out there. You look at, you know, um, Ollie Wines, for example, you know, how much he's just looks like he's going to improve this year. And you go right across the... The team, there's so much quality there. You know, we can't keep them all down for too long. And I think once, uh, you know, Wingard and um, um, uh, Jackson Trengove and a few of those players who who haven't had a lot of preseason of late because of injuries, uh, they'll come good. And when they come good, you watch out. Port Adelaide's going to be a real force uh, this year. I've no doubt about that. Well, that was probably the biggest disappointment for me as a supporter. Uh, with the milestone game and how we like to, uh, you know, reward our players and that, and, and Jacko didn't really get that. I, uh, it's a bit of a shame for such a loyal, great player he's been in his first hundred games, but I'm sure he'll get rewarded further down the track. But I thought def- their defensive unit was pretty strong for the whole game, considering the pressure they were under from Sydney. And I, as you're saying, with the quality of player, and there's one player I was talking to Craig before the show started was Robbie Gray. I mean. He's really flown under the radar. In the first two weeks, he's already racked up 63 disposals and he's in uh, double digits for clearances and inside 50s. I mean, he's had a great start to the year, which has just sort of been uh, um, looked over because of the results we're having. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look at, between him and Bike, sorry, Jimmy, but geez, they were getting smashed, weren't they? They were just hitting him so hard. Uh, you know, and that's the way Sydney plays. Sydney are, are played really strong and looked look stronger than us, actually, I must admit. Um, but, yeah, but, look, these guys are fantastic players. They're just going to you know, keep going. They'll come good. They'll click. Uh, and, uh, you know, especially having a lot of new players in, in there. Look, I'm not sure Red was probably the, you know, the, it was probably a bit of a uh, risk playing someone like Red and who hadn't played for that long. And he looked like he, he was short of a gallop or two. Um, but, you know, again, he'll come good. There'll be some changes this week. I've, I've no doubt about it because we'll need to really be some, uh, turn into a running side when we're playing at Idiad against our North Melbourne, who we've struggled with. So we'll, we'll see what the changes are, but I don't think that anyone's panicking at this stage. Mm. What do you think, yeah, look, Tim? For me, I, I really liked uh, the defensive setups. I thought our defensive setups were really, really good, especially when we got the ball forward of centre. Um, the way we were setting up across that centre line, it, it made it really, really hard for Sydney to, uh, to get past. Um, unfortunately, it, it was it all came down to skills for me. I thought if we had decent skills going inside fifty, we would have been a big chance of winning that game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, less least being in it earlier, and and, and that's the thing that you know too many missed shots. Uh, and I'm I'm hot on the amount of AFL footballers that I see week in week out watching games who miss shots that are within the forty five uh, degrees, sometimes dead in front. 25 metres out, it just seems like that you know the whole pressure takes over rather than the routine just being there, regardless. And yeah, I, it does frustrate me. But anyway, I, I think uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, as a, as a team and a club, I, I I think we will learn a lot out of these early weeks. And it's probably the I don't know if you if you want to use the analogy the, the sting in the tail to um, make us work harder and get better again and uh, you know if we had started off with three or four wins and and think that uh, we're well beaters and we're just going to waltz in and win an AFL grand final well that's just you just kick yourself because this is as hard a competition as there is and year in year out doesn't matter what you've done the year before you're starting from scratch and uh, the top four is no longer the top four and the bottom four can Rise to the top. You just don't know. So you've got to work hard, and I reckon we're learning some some valuable lessons, and also we will test ourselves and see how good we are to get out of it. That's the that's the real secret. So um, you know, that's that's mm-hmm. going to be the exciting bit for me. I'm, I'm I'm fully confident that we are going to be 
still a very good side this year. It's just, uh, I just think it's going to be a different pattern. If we can come out of the next three weeks, uh, two and three, the draw really opens up after that, and our next eight or nine games after that are really, really winnable. Yeah, well, that, that appears the way now, but uh, you you just don't know what form sides are going to show. And, you know, Essendon probably did that on the weekend where you go, gee, nobody expected that. Um, and that's what happened. But it's the consistency of teams that, you know, makes you either top four, scrape in the eight, or don't make it. So that consistency is what's going to uh, be the difference for us, I believe. Yeah, look, I think just to back up to myself, there we're going to be... Uh... This this period is going to be a blessing in disguise because it's, it's still a young yeah. squad and young heads, yeah, and they could potentially, as Timmy mentioned, they could get carried away thinking, oh yeah, we're just going to cruise along now and win a premiership. But all of a sudden, they've had this big reality check with that, guys. You've got to win the contested ball, whether you like it or not. There's no easy way out of this. You've got to win that ball, and and you're kicking efficiency, and it's something they've been working on all pre seasons. Their efficiency, and it's uh, it's been pretty ordinary the last few weeks. So so you know, I'm I'm sure that hard work will will we should be able to capitalise on that in the next few weeks as uh, as we start to pick up the pace of the game. And, look, the other thing I think we've forgotten is that Kennedy for Sydney, didn't he play a fantastic game? Every time he went near the mm. ball in the middle, he just creamed us and uh, just kept getting the ball out and uh, kept fa- finding the ball, feeding his mad runners. And, and he was probably the difference between the two teams, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think we, we're completely forgetting about is we were all salivating over the summer thinking how good is it going to be when we've got the Loby rider combination. Well, we haven't had it. Mm. Yeah. And, and that's, the, that's the harsh reality. Poor old Reddo, they, they would, you know, in their plans would have been thinking, OK, well, he's going to take six to eight weeks of match practice. And, you know, unfortunately, after one week, he's been forced to sort of go in uh, com- completely not ready. So, um, you know... That's been the real tragedy, is Loby being injured. And I don't know how serious that is and, and when he'll come back. And, you know, if it's a, if it's a serious driver strain, um, they can be really bad because you, you can run, but sometimes as soon as you go to kick, it tears again. So, Have they actually announced what the injury is with um, Loby or they've sort of kept that in-house? Well, they keep saying it's a, a, a quad. tight quad, which is, is your driver. So mm. I, I don't know if it, you know, the difference between tight and torn is, is quite significant. So mm. um, you, had a, you had a quad back in the day, Tim. Did you, didn't you have a driver injury and you missed about 13 weeks? Uh, correct. I didn't miss 13, George. That's a, a, an exaggeration, <laughs> which is unusual for you. Um, but it was uh, 10 games I missed. I kept 10. Did, yeah. did he talk about it for 13 weeks, George? No, no, we didn't get a kick for 13 weeks is what I meant to say. <laughs> So I'm on one leg and one quarter. I had more than them. Well, I'm, ho- I'm hoping that Loby isn't uh, out for 13 weeks because that'd be a disaster. I, I was probably one of those supporters that uh, maybe took him for granted a little bit and, and didn't really think his influence was as great as potentially what it is. And now I'm starting to see uh, uh, how much influence he is having in a game. And I think it's maybe his second efforts, especially around the ruck contest, where he's able to lock that ball in for our crummers, if, uh, even if he doesn't win the tap. His his stocks. If I was his manager, I'd be going to the table and say, "Hey, let's have a chat," because his uh, his stocks just went up. I reckon through the roof. Yeah, no, lucky we've uh, signed him up for a while. He's all right. He's safe. Mm. Oh, well done. What you've done something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, God. Yeah. All good. So, um, but the good news is the Maggie boys. So the AFL boys playing in the in the Magpie side. They are looking sensational, and uh, I know it was only one game, but from reports I've seen about the players there, there's some. Uh, there's a lot of players knocking on the door, ready to to come up, and uh, yeah, we'll see if there's any changes this week. But yeah, interesting. George, Tim, you heard was, much? Sorry, George, that was amazing. You just asked that because I had Porsche tweet us in saying any chance a magpie tall like Mitch Harvey being up to speed to come into the side later in the year as a structure improvement, perhaps. Uh, Tim, do you, oh, look, oh, Mitch is a good player. I'm not sure he's quite ready just yet, but I know they're looking at him quite closely. But, yeah, I'm not sure he'll be our ruckman. Would he? What's he a centre-half forward normally, isn't he, Tim? Yeah, he has a crack in ruck. But um, I think the guy they were looking for key forward-wise was uh, Mason Shaw. But, unfortunately, he got a bit of uh, 
um, OP, a bit of osteitis pubis uh, in the sort of last three weeks leading into game. So he's, he's going to be a slow recovery, unfortunately. So that's a bit of a bummer. But, um, yeah, other than that, Butch went back, did the right thing, kicked four goals. Uh, Nathan Crack apparently outstanding. And, um, you know, he's, he's there. They can elevate if they wish to, but um, I think they're just holding their gun... Uh, powder on that one, and then um, Sammy uh, Gray played really well. Up. Apparently, mm. what about what about my old uh, sponsor Brendan Archie? He had a, a breakout game. Great game, I reckon. I, I had a chance. Really yeah, really I had a to, yeah, really pleasing to hear that. Really yeah. pleasing. Got them, definitely got you know that that talent you can see, and you see it in in little bursts, but you want to see it consistently and that sounds like uh, that's starting to come for him which is really exciting yeah and uh, someone posted on the big footy forum about you know maybe he should be selected this week and my sort of view was that I'd, I'd probably I don't know I'd like to hear your thoughts on this guys but I'd probably rather keep him in the SANFL for a little bit longer and, and let him really try to build up some repeat performances and, and really get some confidence up before throwing him back into the AFL side I agree yeah. I think so. I don't think they'll be taking any risks on players, untried players, I would suggest. I think if they put someone up, it's someone that's played previously and can play a set position. Um, you know, uh, Paul Archie is going to try to break in the midfield, and that's going to be tough tough work for him to try to break into that side. But you know, there, there are a couple of positions there which you'd think you know, probably come under, like the, the small forward and maybe a small back, but they're probably the only two positions I'd see changing and potentially the ruck. Mm. Anyway, yeah, and uh, I reckon the other thing about the, the coaching team is that there's a after two weeks and two losses, and, and the second one being significant, uh, there's a real thing about yeah getting the gun out, and and I reckon there's a, there's a lot to be said about a bit of stability and 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 backing in uh, the guys you've chosen, and I think that they'll be trying to do that this week without, like George says, probably one, two changes at the most. One's forced because of Jarman Impey and uh, his injury. But um, I think that they would be uh, be trying to keep the changes minimalistic and uh, yeah. and faith. What about, I'll throw a name out for you. I've sort of contradicted myself with this one um, now because at first I wanted... Jake need out, but then on reflection, I, I don't think I want him out because I, I was looking at his game and, yeah, he had a couple of turnovers in each game in the first two rounds, but to me it looked like confidence because when he was delivering the ball back to players when it was uh, dead play, so to speak, he was hitting targets, no dramas whatsoever, and his, and his inside 50 forward pressure is fantastic. So I, I just think he's got a bit of a confidence issue under a bit of pressure. Now, you know, do you... Is that actually helping a player with calls to, to drop him back to the SANFL or do you have to sort of stick with him and sort of back him through those confidence troughs? You've definitely got to give him some some time in it. I reckon it's the old story. It's harder to get out the team, harder to get in the team than it is to get out of it. Um, so I, I think when you're in, it, there is cause for... If he was doing everything wrong and not being competitive, I think you're right. You go, well, you know, we're all about effort and you're not giving any. But he is. You, you're right. He is giving effort. He needs to polish up that that uh, especially you know he's a small forward. It is starvation corner at times, and when you get those shots for goal, you just got to make sure that you're a, a dead eye dick and and you just keep nailing your opportunities. So, I I, I tend to agree with you, Rick. I'd, I'd be backing him in and just keep telling him those other one percenters are really good, but we just tidy up that other stuff and you and you've got a really uh, excellent game under your belt. So, I, I'm I'm with you. And, uh, and I'd like to see him uh, backed in again this week. And nobody's probably standing up to say, oh, I'm the small forward, I want to take that spot either. I, I'm, mm. I'm not sure if there was anybody you know, ringing big alarm bells to, uh, to say, pick me. Yeah, I think if they if, if they do drop Need, I think um, you've, he's a confidence player. And I think last year he played a lot of SNFL footy and then they brought him back towards the end for the finals. He was fantastic, so... I would hate for them to drop because I think uh, he would just drop his bundle and you know, find it hard to break back in, especially from an SANFL point of view. But he does the hard work up forward, and that's what his role really is. He's that defensive forward. He's really tackles, keeps the ball in the area, uh, tackles hard and uh, really puts pressure on the opposition. So from that point of view, he does his job and does it very well. His finishing needs to you know, 
be better. You know, some of those skills errors he showed over the last couple of weeks have been really disappointing, but I think his uh, pressure puts you know, it's probably the, the highlight of his game rather than worrying about some of the turnovers he's put on. Yeah. Mm. I think the most pleasing thing for me from Friday night is uh, is a player that's almost become the forgotten man, Sammy Cahoon. His first game back from uh, from his ACL last year, he had 25 touches and 11 marks, and it, it was fantastic to see him get through unscathed. Yeah, I remember, what a great, uh, what a great recruit he got. Yeah, yeah, I've seen Sammy play for the first time, and, and I remember saying to him when we, we met them that time, George, that I said, Sammy, you've got that horrible problem where you just keep finding the ball. <laughs> so now, now you just got to uh, adjust to the pace of AFL and, you know, obviously you get stronger as you get more mature. But, mate, I don't think you're going to have a problem. You, you got that uncanny gift. Your work rate's outstanding. But you got that uncanny gift of finding the footy. It's it's a, it's a gift. It's fantastic. So, no, nah, he's exciting. I, I know that they'll want him to, you know, play a few in the, in the SNFL and, and really... But if he just keeps clocking them up like that, he's gonna he's gonna pick himself. The old the old story about selection is sometimes you just pick yourself, and uh, eventually they go, well, we have to play. Him. He's ready. Yeah, sounds a bit like you back in your day, mate. You used to pick yourself. <laughs> I was gonna say something else, but <laughs> I, had good, I had a good relationship with the coaches, no doubt about that. But I didn't go around frigging uh, buying cars off them and things like that, like you did. Oh, I just cut it out. <laughs> cut it out. I told the boys before it was the best rover ever to play back pocket in this football club. Oh, come you. on. Come on, Mr. Kale. What cars have you got? Can I buy another one? <laughs> did, it, did it work? Is that, how, is that how you got in the sign? Yeah, Jeez. well. Yeah. Seven flags later. What do you reckon? Gee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good we, we've got a question here on Twitter from from Tom um, about Hamish Hartlett. Um, he's just asking what his current role is in the team and should he be in the gun for his last few performances? Oh, Timmy, oh. You, you're mentoring him. I, I can tell you now it's, that... It's all your fault, by the way. No way in, in, uh, there's no way in the hell that he's 100% fit. You can see that... that First, especially that Fremantle game. I was actually pretty happy with him in the Fremantle game. He got a lot out of himself that I don't think he, he should have. He, and he had nowhere near that strength and power in his kicking or his running. And it, he was a little maybe more fluent in the Sydney game. I'm expecting him to probably hit more uh, around what we're used to out of Hamish this week. So I saw a, a gradual improvement as far as movement went. But I actually was happy with his Fremantle game. And he looked to be playing sort of half back and behind the footy. But when he's up and about, he'll be going through the midfield again, which uh, I, I think they've asked a lot of Hamish in these first two rounds, which I reckon he's, his body hasn't quite been ready for it. And I, I think that he's probably stood up reasonably well. So I don't think... Uh, I think if, if you knew what he was carrying, I think people would be a bit more empathetic towards uh, the normal power we see in his game. So... Um, that'll come back, and I'm sort of expecting a bit more of it this week. So, um, so Tim, I, I would who, say hold tight and keep faith in uh, in the hammer. So, Tim, who else? Uh, who are the five players they rushed back in round one? So, Hamish was one of them. Uh, Trengo was the other. Wingard was also one. Who was the other? There's another two that came back. Ryder, Ryder, Ryder Montfries. Ryder Montfries. Two. Sorry, they're the two. Yeah, sorry, you're right. Yes. Yeah, the Asada uh, saga. So, yeah, it was right. Montfries and Ryder. So, so you, you, we can expect those five to improve. You know, I think Hamish has shown that uh, you know, he is sore. He, he, he doesn't look 100% fit at all. But, um, and you know, he's he'll another one. He's only five minutes, you know, five minutes of that trial. Though. Yeah. Well, there's rumour going around that um, Bokey's carrying a bit of an injury. And uh, the other player that I thought was in was interesting on Saturday night was Jay Shields because especially in the last quarter, that kick for goal, he definitely didn't kick through it and... Um, just looked like maybe he uh, was a bit reluctant with his kicks and maybe he's carrying something as well. You never yeah. know. And uh, that's the thing. I mean, all players play with injuries at some stage or another, but it's not real good when you've got them right at the beginning of the year. You normally like to go into that first sort of couple of rounds really fresh. So um, you're right. Not ideal um, preparation for our guys that we've got so many with those 
little niggles that they're carrying. So hopefully a lot of that comes good and quickly. But it's the old story, exactly like the, the tweet that came through. Once you're over that line, your supporters want you to be 100%. And they want you to perform at 100%. So uh, they don't care if you've got anything wrong with you. Bad luck. <laughs> that's the, that's yeah, exactly. the ruthless. That's the ruthless expectation of our footy club that I love. Mm. Yep, that's well, right. You well, put on that Guernsey. We expect uh, you to be 100% fit and just put in 100% effort, which they do. You know, but there are players that will get better. And I think, I think from uh, Schultz's point of view, like he, yeah, he wasn't kicking the way he normally kicks, was he? Like he, he kicked that fantastic mm. front of boundary and then missed two or three from you know slight angles, which is un- unlike him, but. I don't think he's carrying much. I think it was just, uh, you know, just the moment they got him, and he he just you know pulled pulled the ball a little bit. But anyway, hopefully this yeah. week he kick him all like he normally does. Well, fingers crossed. Hopefully, because we need a win, and it's going to be a, a big game against our um, nemesis side in North Melbourne, isn't it? Yes, yes. It's uh, especially playing at Eddie Hat again. So we've got to beat him. You know. It, we, we, we just uh, we just can't afford not to to be three zip. George, stop yes. calling it Eddie Had. It, it's not built for idiots like you. It's Eddie Had. <laughs> That's what I said, didn't I? <laughs> it's annoying me. <laughs> Eddie Had. I thought it was Eddie Had. <laughs> what is it, Craig? You know everything, mate. Rick, I think you uh, you nailed it on the head there. Did I'm I? not even going to try and pronounce it. So. So, I'm sitting on the fence. Isn't it Injury Stadium? Uh, should the boys even be playing there after what happened last weekend? And we've got um, a player potentially considering suing the uh, AFL over an injury. Gee, oh, yeah. it, it's amazing. This this uh, surface has been an issue since the year 2000 when it opened. Um, yeah, it's had, it's had something you know go wrong or some claim too hard and all the rest of it for a long time. So. Yeah, I don't know about that one on the weekend. That was an interesting one, wasn't it? They reckon just hitting the edge of the other side of the grass, uh, the leg went out. So, gee whiz, I don't know. But look, it's a great game to watch, a uh, great venue to watch footy. And because the atmosphere is different, the ball seems to travel faster and longer and, you know, through the air and all the rest of it, longer goals. And it's, it's normally built for pretty exciting footy, which hopefully we're, we're going to be playing on. Said he not. Jeez, tell me something wrong with your microphone. All that crap you're talking is obviously clogging it all up, mate. Can you give it a clean? <laughs> I, I actually think it might be filtering through from your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they, maybe George will have to come over and clean it for you, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Right, yes. So, no, look, you, North Melbourne are always tough. North Melbourne are always tough, and uh, you know it, it doesn't come any easier in that ruck area because uh, Goldstein's one of the the big ruckmen of the comp who can really hit to advantage. So that's going to be another challenge for us. Uh, we're going to win. Oh, very confident we're going to win and win easy. I reckon. There's my prediction. Well, I reckon North Melbourne's a bit slow. Yep. Yeah. Well, we're, they're, they're not going to play that defensive game that uh, Frio and Sydney. I do so they're going to let us run, and I think that's uh, that's where we'll get a bit of our confidence back, and we'll just uh, run steamroll right over top of them, and uh, you know hopefully our three key power, uh, key tall timbers up forward like Schulte and Westy and and Ryder really take advantage of the uh, the ball, you know, getting that ball coming in nice and quickly, and start to really capitalise and kick some goals. So I think uh, it's going to be a real shootout, but I think we're going to run right, right over top of them. That's my prediction anyway. Are we on next week? Do I? Uh, do we'll I have to hide next week if my prediction comes doesn't come true? You've got to come back on again, do you? <laughs> oh, I'm ready for bed. What time is it? Oh, nine o'clock. Well, you, we've done well. We, we've hit our hour, yeah. which is usually our, our turn-off point. So uh, you told us you were only going to stay on for 15 minutes, George. So we've sucked you in like we do with all our guests when they come on this show. Well, exactly. I haven't had a chance to tell you half the stories about myself yet. <laughs> Hey, George, tell him about, uh, you know, he's saying he wanted to go to bed. You tell him about the horse you were going to name. Oh, here we go. What was, what was the horse? Oh, yeah, in bed before nine. That's right. <laughs> in bed by nine, yeah. it was called. <laughs> there was a group of us going to buy a racing horse, and uh, we go, what do we call it? We've got to call something about us, unique about us. We go, well, 
yeah, in bed by nine because we're hopeless. We can't stay up late at all. But I know that feeling, mate. Don't worry, I've got about an hour drive home from here, so uh, yeah, we. Uh, I won't be head off to, the, to bed before nine, but uh, I'll be off to Palm Cove on on in Cairns tomorrow. So uh, I'll be sitting back on the beach Jeez. by about midday. Good life. Yes. yes. Thank you. Paul. It'll rain up there. I don't, I don't really care. It'll be nice and warm and uh, there'll be some wet water and uh, I'll be spending it with my wet lovely water. wife. That's good. Yeah, with our 10-year wedding anniversary to Melissa. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, isn't well done, Rick. And Pass cheers. Pass on my condolences to Melissa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how she's done it. She's lasted this long, but uh, she's hopefully she's got another 40 in her. <laughs> oh, love it. Great stuff. All right, well, I'm winding up. Yeah, we got. Is that it for us, Craig? Yeah, that's it, mate. Thank you yeah. so much for coming on, George and Tim. My pleasure. As your boys. Yeah. Apologies yeah. about Tim, but he'll come good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, and look, keep listening throughout the week, as we'll have uh, the normal two podcasts a week, and we're going to do them live from now on. And also keep an ear out uh, for the Port Adelaide Pair Show on uh, on Friday, and also the new AFL Review Show on uh, on the weekend. And we'll also yep. have a brand new Port Adelaide show starting next week as well. Yeah, we've got a uh, we've got a big hour starting up next Tuesday, boys. This is pretty relevant for you guys, I guess. Is that he he's doing a show on the the history of uh, Port Adelaide. He wants to go through historic historic moments like all the premierships and stuff like that. So uh, he's keen to uh, talk to some of the old premiership players and get them on the show and and sort of give some info back to the fans on those sort of times. So we'll have to touch base with you about uh, maybe hitting up some of the former players that might be willing to come on air and share some stories. Oh, that'd be good. I'd like to see Bob Philp on Skype. That'd be terrific. (laughs) (laughs) He'll definitely be in bed now. (laughs) They might have started earlier. What what about Greg Phillips? It better be a 7 a.m. show, mate, I'll tell you. Would would Greg come on, you reckon? Big Coochie, yeah. You, you might have to get Aaron to help him out with the uh, the skyping bit, but uh, Big Coochie yeah. be a good laugh. Don't worry about that. Yeah, right. oh, we'll have to you work on great stories. Yes, love it. All right, boys. Good night, thanks, gentlemen. Yeah, thanks, Gene. Well done. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, Craig. Too easy, mate. We did it. We did it. I hope you had a uh, a good night, and I hope everyone that's listening. Uh, had a great night as well, and thanks for listening in. And we'll only get bigger and better from here. That's it. Sky's the limit, buddy. Have we got, a, we got any outro music, or do I just uh, need to sing a song to close oh, this look, off? Look, sing a song, buddy. No, you don't want to hear me sing. No, definitely not. <laughs> Edelweiss, Edelweiss. There you go. Shut it off, Craig. Done. See you later, everyone. Bye. Right up towards Hodges, who leaps at it. Spectacular effort with one hand, and speaking about report cards with distinctions, here's Jimena. One of the best games I've ever seen from him. The little rover, 18 and 5, gets his second goal, and he kept Port Adelaide in the game. Now he's probably stitched it up.